the brain is wired for change, but it resists change because the moment you say, hey, I want to go to the gym, uh, your brain's sort of like pretty on board with it because it's an idea. Then when you actually make that effort to go, you know, if you're on the East Coast, it's cold in the morning, you got to go outside. Uh, if you're on the West Coast, you probably have some other things like, you know, I might, I'd rather just take in, take in the sunshine or rather just sort of be outside. The moment your brain knows that you are committed to an action, it actually starts creating brain chaos, which we call cognitive dissonance. And when there is cognitive dissonance, the brain goes back to what it was doing previously so that it doesn't have to deal with that chaos. So what we know is that even though the brain is wired to change, it is often not predisposed to engage in that change when that change is an actual action because of the brain chaos that results. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Srini, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks for inviting me. It's really lovely to be back. Yeah. So, you know, you're back uh, for the third time, which says a whole hell of a lot about the first two interviews. It's very rare that we bring somebody back three times, especially within the course of a year. But um, given how much we learned from you in our previous two interviews, I figured it was kind of a no brainer to start the year with you. But before we get into what we're going to specifically talk about, uh, I want to ask you a question that I don't believe that I've asked you before. And that is, do you have siblings? If so, what birth order were you? And what did that what impact did that end up having on your life? Um, I do. I have an older brother. Um, I, I, I idealize him. So I, I just think he's sort of an amazing human being. In fact, when people ask me to describe him, I generally say that he is the best human being on earth. So um, I'm, I'm very excited about who he is. I think he's been a real guiding influence in my life um, from the time I was little up until now. And I think having some, even though he's five years older than me, we really played a lot together, and we uh, even when we'd fight, you know, we'd fight with each other, and uh, then my parents would sort of try to chime in, and then we would fight with them. So we have a very strong bond, and I think that bond has actually set the stage for a number of the bonds in my friendship so far. So, um, in fact, the other day he was teasing me about this because he, he teases me, Oscar, his robot, because he knows it sort of mildly irritates me. But he says things, if I ask him, you know, what's your opinion on this? And do you think I should be doing this career wise? And he'll say, okay, listen, I programmed Oscar. I know what's good for Oscar. And we sort of have a joke about it. Uh, but I think underneath that is just a profound sense of love that flows both ways. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's interesting because I have a, a five-year age gap with uh, my sister. Um, so the two questions come from that. One, do you think that age gap can have an impact on the level of the bond? Because, you know, despite our five-year age gap, I don't think my sister and I have quite the bond that you do with your, you know, uh, you do with your brother. Um, the other question uh, around that is, you know, what, what do you think creates those bonds between siblings? And what would you say to parents who are listening who have more than one kid? Well, I, I think it's different for every family. I think one of the things I'm very humbled by is how different every kid is and how different every kid grows up. And the one thing I will say is I remember once being referred uh, the teenage child of, of people who are very well known for uh, just really producing some of the best research in children in the world. And when I met the child, I realized that even people who know that much are faced with the challenge of raising their kids. So the very first thing I would say is that the most that parents can do is their best. I don't think that perfect is possible. Uh, and I think to the extent that you can encourage your kids to be close, do do that. The second thing I would do is share a personal story, which is that when I came home, apparently from the hospital, my parents were a little worried because my, my brother had been the only child and they wondered how he would take to me. So what they said to him was that he was going to be having a baby come home and that he would be responsible for this baby. And that he should take care of the baby. So apparently my parents told me that when I was a newborn, they came into the room and they saw that he had melted chocolate in his hand and he was trying to feed it to me. And they were you know, obviously alarmed. And they were like, what are you doing? He said, well, you said he's mine. And I like chocolate and I want him to like chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know, that's funny because it's actually defined our relationship so much beyond that. Like even when I was a little older, he would get me Easter eggs that were like literally bigger than my head. 
And there are photographs of that. And he would say he just liked the gusto with which I would sort of lean forward and want to sort of consume the entire egg. And and I said, you know, this must come from that chocolate you were feeding me when I was a newborn, sort of just lying down in this crib. And then, I, and to, to this day, I, I love chocolate. So I, I would say that having the child who is already at home feel a sense of responsibility about the child who is coming mm-hmm. creates an additionally different dynamic because rather than them being competitive, you know that they might be competitive with the parents for that affection. And what that does is it allows the children to be closer. Mm-hmm. I, I would say the third thing is that we were raised to really celebrate each other's successes in a pretty major way. And I think a lot of people know that there's nothing, in, in, in many ways, there's just something pretty amazing about watching someone else's success and knowing that you contributed to it in some way. Mm-hmm. And I think because we both have the sense of how supportive we were to each other, we were able to celebrate each other's successes even more. And I think that that contributed to to our closeness as well. So in relation to those two things, I would say to parents, do encourage the older child to also have a caretaking role and to feel included in the process rather than excluded from the new experience. Yeah. Well, yeah, unlike me, who, you know, instead of feeding chocolate to my sister, I, I questioned how we could return her to the hospital. Right. <laughs> well, my, I have to say, my brother sometimes teases me when he engages my eccentricities. He goes, you know, I mean, I'm not surprised that you like to wear clothes like that. I mean, we actually bought you at the market because I was feeling, and I, you know, if, when I was little, that used to alarm me. Uh, so it's not like when I say I idealize him, I don't feel like every interaction is perfect or that we don't hurt each other on occasion or we don't disappoint each other. I just think we know how to recover from that. And we, because the bond is primary, whatever else happens is secondary. Mm. You know, um, I'm, I'm curious, is your brother also a doctor? Like what, um, you know, uh, what career choices has he made and, and what, if any, impact did his career choices have on yours? Um, he is a uh, doctor. So he's he's a general practitioner. He actually studied in primary care and general practice, but decided to go ahead with general with being a general practitioner. So we were the first two doctors in the family, and I think his choice of medicine as a career made me really happy. Uh, it didn't necessarily push me in that direction. In fact, nobody pushed me in that direction because I I loved medicine as much as I loved music and languages. And in fact, my because it was kind of a a boring tradition that 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 students of Indian descent who did well would go into medicine. Because I did well at music, my music teachers called my parents uh, from you know to school and said, "Listen, you know your kid's good at the sciences, but is also good at music." It would be really nice and diverse for the community for him to for him to do music. So when my parents came home, they said, "Well, you know, your your brother's doing medicine. Like, what would you like to do?" And I said, "Well, what would you like me to do?" And my father, I think, was wise because he knew how rebellious I was. And so he said, "Listen, I'm not going to tell you what to do for the rest of your life, because if you don't like it, you're going to blame me for the rest of your life." So I said, "Well, why are you pretending to have no preference? You obviously want me to be a doctor." And he said, "Because." You're not asking me what I like. You're asking me what you want, what I think you should do. What I like, sure, I think it would be better for you. I think you can do music later on. So I said to him, music is a primary passion. He said, see, you're already opposing me and I'm not telling you to do music. And when I talked to my brother about it, I think it was really helpful because he helped me understand that my love for medicine didn't just come from the technical aspects of science or the technical aspects of what medicine was, but at a fundamental level, I could not conceive of going through this life without having a detailed understanding of the human body. And even before it came to understanding illnesses per se, it was that aesthetic judgment that gave me some kind of sublimity. It made me feel sublime to have to be able to understand the body in that much detail. So my brother, I think, influenced that decision, but he wasn't part of any kind of persuasion. Mm, Wow. Well, let's do this. Um, Let's shift gears and get into why you and I are talking today. You know, people are listening to this. It's the very first episode of Unmistakable Creator for the New Year. And the thing that is often on so many people's minds is, you know, how am I going to accomplish goals this year? And also, how am I going to make this year different than last year? But I want to start by asking, why is it that we see a certain type of behavior at this time of year and that behavior doesn't sustain? For example, the, the gyms are apparently super crowded the first few days after the year, and then it just goes back to normal within a few weeks. Um, you know, why, why is it that people's attempts, why, why do humans behave in such a way um, when they attempt to make change that's unsustainable? 
Okay, so I, so that's a, I think a very large question. I actually do a three day workshop on just that question. Yeah. So it's a, it's a it's a detailed question, but I'll tell you the first thing that comes to mind is that the brain is wired for change, but it resists change because the moment you say, "Hey, I want to go to the gym," uh, your brain's sort of like pretty on board with it because it's an idea. Then when you actually make that effort to go, you know, if you're on the East Coast, it's cold in the morning, you got to go outside. Uh, if you're on the West Coast, you probably have some other things like, you know, I might, I'd rather just take on take in the sunshine or rather just sort of be outside. The moment your brain knows that you are committed to an action, it actually starts creating brain chaos, which we call cognitive dissonance. And when there is cognitive dissonance, the brain goes back to what it was doing previously so that it doesn't have to deal with that chaos. So what we know is that even though the brain is wired to change, it is often not predisposed to engage in that change when that change is an actual action because of the brain chaos that results. Mm -hmm. So how do we deal with that change then? Or how do we deal with the the cognitive dissonance? What's the key to, to managing that? So there are a lot of different ways. I think the one way that I think um, I often tell people about is something called spreading of alternatives. So we assume that if you tell our, if we tell our brains, hey, we're going to the gym, we assume our brains are going to hold on to that information for a long period of time. But the reality is that the brain does not hold on to that information. You've got to feed it pros and cons constantly for that information to remain online. Because when you say, I want to go to the gym, that becomes a short-term memory, but your short-term memory cup becomes full very quickly because in the course of a day, there are a lot of different things that happen. So that particular message gets displaced from the cup. So there's a procedure called spreading of alternatives, which is shown to increase commitment to change by activating the left frontal cortex of the brain. So let me explain what the technical term means. When you think about uh, spreading of alternatives, you think about two alternatives. Alternative A is now. Let me go to the gym occasionally. Alternative B is later, which is let me go to the gym uh, two times a week or three times a week. Now, the brain needs to know as a summary that alternative B is way superior to alternative A. And just by recognizing it on a one-time basis does not convince the brain of that. So what people should do, and I would recommend that they take out a piece of paper and a pen, is write down what your alternative A is right now, right? Is your alternative A um, that you are working out X times a week? Alternative B is how many times you actually want to be working out. Now, write down the advantages of A, which would be things like allows me to be lazy, gives me more time. And then write down the advantages of B, which would be things like It will protect my heart. It will allow me to be more flexible because my body will be in a better condition. My mind will be in a better condition. Uh, I will be able to develop strength. I will be able to develop flexibility. I will be able to meet people at the gym. I will feel better about my life overall. The more you start to create a spread so that it is much more obvious that B is better than A, the more the left frontal cortex activates and the more you are likely to change. So the spreading of alternatives is basically writing down two alternatives and outlining them so much that your brain understands why the choice you're making is better. When it does this, it pays what we call the switch cost. And the switch cost is the psychological price that you pay for change. So when there's a change in your life, and in a lot of times it's not just the gym, it may be a new romantic partner, it may be a new job, it may be that you want to find a new way of living your life, it may even be that you want, you want to find deeper meaning in your life. Well, to face any of that, you pay a psychological price because the new vista creates fear, it creates lack of familiarity, it makes you anxious about the fact that you're moving into unknown territory. So the brain will not, imagine that you are your brain, right? And imagine that you're sitting on your brain throne and you say to your brain, hey, I want to go to the gym more often, or I want a better relationship, or I want to change my job. And, And let's say you have a mortgage, or let's say you have a stable life right now, your brain's going to say, no, thanks. I don't think so. I don't want to pay that switch cost. So when you do spreading of alternatives, what that does is it gives your brain a justification 
to pay that cost. And it is exactly that justification that the column B gives you that allows your brain to do that. The second thing I would say about that is do that often, sit, practice it in conversations at the dinner table, talk to your colleagues about it, and be authentically connected with it. You know, everybody in the world knows it's better to work out than not work out. Everyone in the world knows if you don't like your relationship, leave it. Everyone in the world knows if you don't like your job, find another one. These are not things that are shocking to us. It's not like we don't know that we have to do that. But what is different is that there are resistances that are built into the brain that we've got to overcome. And by targeting our brains, we can get to our goals. So just to summarize that whole construct, Change creates cognitive dissonance or brain chaos. Second point, when there is this chaos, you want to change, but you've got to pay the psychological price for change. That's called switch cost. And the third thing is, in order to pay the switch cost, perform the spreading of alternatives, and this will allow your brain to register the importance of the change. And the fourth thing is, Talk to people about this. Uh, talk, talk, uh, talk to them about it all the time, so that you can actually uh, take yourself to your goal. Now, the fifth thing is that if this doesn't work, there are a lot of other things to think about about change, and that's something we can go into unless you have a, a specific question. Yeah, no, the, 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 we can definitely. Go, let, I do definitely want to go into that as well. Um, there are two questions that kind of arose for me as you were talking about that. One. Uh, was why is it that we see people do something like make New Year's resolutions and they've gotten to the end of this year and they haven't accomplished some goal that they set out to accomplish? Uh, two, what's the uh, role that optimism plays in being able to make out these changes? And then I want to actually go in and talk about specific goals and apply it in a sort of a very practical way. Sure. So I think there are a lot of reasons that people don't reach their goals. I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is that they think that if you apply effort, you will reach your goal. But effort, continuous effort is not helpful. You know, as I've said to you before, if you have continuous focus, it actually exhausts your brain. It makes your brain not look, not be able to appreciate the future because your focus, so your brain doesn't have the energy to appreciate in the, fu the, the future. Your brain doesn't understand what's around it. It doesn't know how to make connections between your health or your future and now, and it can't be creative. So. Too much focus can hurt the brain. So the one thing I will say is in your lifestyle, build in enough periods of unfocus so that you can relax your brain, so you can allow your brain to actually have the effort that it needs when it needs it. The second thing is that there is a theory called the selfish goal theory, which, is, which basically states that any one of us at any one point in time have more than just one goal. You know, like even though you have the goal of going to the gym at one time, you also have the goal of eating chocolate. And so you can go to the gym and eat chocolate at the same time. That's fine. But you have to figure out what your own priorities are. And these goals are going to compete in the brain. So there has to be a way in which you prioritize, if your goal is to go to the gym and, and to, to obey a stricter diet, you've got to slap a first class tag onto the priority goal. And part of what you do is, is you actually build that into your life. You say, maybe every week I will put a picture of that goal on my desk and every Sunday I will find a new picture to inspire me. Maybe I'll put it on my desktop. Maybe I'll make it part of my screensaver. Maybe I'll put it next to my toothbrush. You know, places where you're gonna be so that your reminders are constant and you are prioritizing that goal. Now, the next thing I would say is that one of the, one of the things that I think intimidates people, and here we're getting a little bit deeper into this, but uh, you know, Kierkegaard, the philosopher, said that anxiety is the dizziness of freedom, meaning that if we achieve our goals, we would be free, right? If you're going to the gym, you're gonna be physically free. If you're going to have a different relationship, you'll be romantically free. If you are going to make more money, you'll be financially free. Now, this freedom sounds very attractive and everybody believes that this is the way to go. But the problem is that even though psychologically we desire freedom, we are also intimidated by freedom because it makes us feel like we are without gravity, like we're floating in outer space. So what Kierkegaard said was that anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. Even though we are free, we also crave gravity. And as a response to that, we often prevent ourselves from moving forward. And when we prevent ourselves from moving forward, we are unable 
to we we are unable to let go of gravity because we build in these locks and chains into our lives. Like a lot of people will say, well, you know, I can't do that. I've got a family now. I can't do that. I've got a job that keeps me at work from you know nine to nine. I can't do that because. I've got, you know, you can come up with as many excuses as possible. Everybody, smart people especially, have really great valid excuses. The excuses are not wrong. The question is, how do other people like you do it? So I would say to you, switch to possibility thinking. If you say, I've got a nine to five job or nine to nine job, uh, I can't do this. I would say, do you think there's anyone else in the world who has that job who's working out? And there probably is. What do they do? If you say, I'm a mother of two and I hold two jobs. Completely understandable. Do you think there's any mother of two who holds two jobs who does this? And in every instance you will see that it's not really a question of your demographics, which are valid reasons for why you're not changing, but a question of your motivation to manage your demographics so that, you know, for example, can you give the children over to your spouse for a bit? Can you hire a caretaker for a small period of time to prioritize your own health and your own future? Because if you don't do that, nobody's going to do that. Mm-hmm. I think another piece to this is the notion of, uh, you know, if, if you think about, you know, why am I not reaching my goals? I think there's this notion of motivational representation, which is sort of a complicated way of saying that it's not just effort that gets you to your goals. You've got to be engaged with your life and your goals. So studies have shown that if the self circuits are not activated, then it doesn't matter how hard you try, you are not engaged in your life. And as you know, a lot of people are just caught up in the monotony of day-to-day existence. They don't feel alive and they don't feel like they're actually involved in what they're supposed to be doing. And if you are not involved in your life, no matter how much effort you apply, you won't be able to get there. And then maybe for this conversation, the, the last thing I'll mention is a concept called positive disintegration, which is that when we change our lives, this brain chaos makes me makes us feel like we are coming apart. And this makes us feel fragmented and disintegrated. Oh my God, if I leave this job, I'm gonna not have anything. How am I gonna find a new job? Even though I hate this job, I feel like I've got nowhere to go. Well, that feeling of fragmentation is undoubtedly a negative feeling. But what you want to do is use the theory, Dabrowski is a Polish psychiatrist and psychologist who spoke about a theory of positive disintegration. And what he said was, in gifted students, for example, when they disintegrate, they actually see that as the puzzle pieces coming apart so that they can put their puzzle pieces together at a higher level. And so rather than panicking at the thought of coming apart, What you can say is you are giving yourself the space and freedom to construct a better solution. And remember, in all of these cases, self-talk really helps. And there are some principles of self-talk I'd like to remind you of. The first is when you use self-talk, speak in the second person and call yourself by name. So if you're trying to go to the gym, if I were trying to go to the gym, rather than saying, I can do it, I would say, Srini, you can do it. So by just using the second person and calling yourself by name, you increase your confidence. The second thing is whatever the feeling is, rather than ignoring it, "Ah, I'm feeling lazy, I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling amotivated, call it out because affect labeling can decrease activation of the anxiety center in the brain. And the third thing is rather than framing your goals in the negative by saying, do not miss the gym, do not uh, give up this relationship, your brain under the particular circumstances will actually do the opposite of what you want. So frame your goals in the positive and this will help you. Now this helps, this brings us to the next question you asked, which is, is there a role for optimism in your life? And what I would say is absolutely with one big caveat. Optimism without authenticity is a lie and you are too smart to outsmart yourself in most instances. So. Positive, there are a lot of studies to show that possibility, thinking, I can have a better body, I can have a better relationship, I can have more money, that's called possibility thinking. And possibility thinking is a very powerful way of changing your brain because it increases dopamine, which activates the reward systems in the brain, and it increases opioids, which, which decreases your stress. 
So I'm not saying that you've got to be in this position where you say everything is possible all the time and it doesn't matter and you can do it. You know, we all know that cheerleading is not the same as truly helping yourself. But what is helpful is if you, you know, sometimes you open your email box and you see like 20 emails, all of which are negative. It's annoying and it takes you out of possibility and you think, you know what, I better just stick with what I've got. This is the best I can do. Reset your brain frequently. Allow your brain to take you to a place where you can feel more motivated and say, how do other people who are in my position do what I need to do? What what would make this possible rather than is this possible? And that kind of possibility thinking really helps. And I think a brand new field that I'm beginning to look at right now is what truly motivates us. And you know, there's something that I think is, is really left out a lot. Uh, and it's this feeling uh, of sublimity, the sublime. So what we know uh, from studies is that beauty and the, sub- and the sublime activate different pathways in the brain. Now, by beauty, I'm talking about something like a butterfly, which when you look at it, you'll say, this is beautiful. It's great. It activates the pleasure centers in the brain. The sublime is that which overwhelms you. So you see, suddenly see an incredible painting that, or, or an incredible sunset, or you, you see a phenomenon that just takes your breath away and you are overwhelmed. That kind of sublimity activates different parts of your brain. Now, human beings, when they experience beauty, experience positive sensations. But I think what a lot of people don't know is that the sublime, while it introduces positive feelings like being awestruck or being happy, the sublime also gives you feelings of terror. What if I don't make it? Or what if I get lost in this? And and so feelings travel together. And these are called mixed emotional states. And studies show that the human condition is such that mixed emotional states are a real thing. You know, somebody asked me in an interview this morning, actually, they said, you know, what do you think makes you the happiest? And I said, you know, the truth is, I don't think feeling states travel in my brain in a single form. Often I'm happy and terrorized and anxious and calm all at the same time. And what studies show is that if you can speak about your emotions happening at the same time, rather than saying, well, you know, I'm happy now and I'm sad now, if you can speak about your feeling states as if they are mixed because they are mixed, you have less depression, less anxiety, fewer bodily symptoms, and you are more positive. So when it comes to positivity, we want to remember the following things. One, reset to positivity a couple times a day. It will increase your dopamine and increase and increase and, de- and, and increase your opioids as well. Number two, when you are resetting to positivity, try to stick with the authenticity. So rather than saying life is great just after your bank has rejected your credit card or just after somebody breaks up with you, what you can say is, Life was just horrible, but what's important for me to know is that it can be better. Call the growth mindset. This is the one factor that equalizes things between children who are poverty-stricken and those who are not. Studies generally show that children who are poverty-stricken do much, much more poorly on exams, but if they have a growth mindset, it equalizes things. And the next thing I would say is as you are being positive, allow yourself to be exposed to subliminal things, things that overwhelm you because there's so many beautiful things, so many beautiful images, so many amazing pieces of music, so many great facts that can actually motivate you by giving you this excitement about life. And so what I would say is that positivity on its own is not enough, but it is necessary with a certain amount of nuance. Wow. Um, What is the role of self-worth in all of this? Well, self-esteem is actually, it's a, it's a very interesting variable because self-esteem, uh, so there are a couple of things. So firstly, self-worth plays a very important role, and there are two things for us to remember. Uh, one is self-esteem maintenance versus self-esteem optimization. So a lot of people will lower the bar in their lives to feel better. You know, they will move to a smaller place, earn less money, um, Say, I, I guess I'm never going to find anybody better than this. Uh, you know what? I'm not like in great shape, but I'm not obese. Who needs to go to the gym? These ish, the people who say this are actually rationalizing things, and they're actually rationalizing their lives so that 
they lower the bar. We call the self-esteem maintenance. You lower the bar to make yourself feel better. Self-esteem optimization is where you raise the bar. You say, listen, I don't really care about you know, obesity as an aesthetic thing, but I care about preserving my heart and I care about preserving my brain. So I'm gonna really try hard to get where I wanna get to. Now, the reason most of us don't consistently optimize is we've already got enough pressure in our lives. Self-esteem optimization actually raises the bar and creates pressure. But as Billie Jean King said, pressure is a privilege. You know, when Serena Williams asked her, he said to her, you know, I'm just feeling so stressed and stressed. She said, well, you know, this is what happens to champions. When you are on top, that's the pressure you face. So we've got to change the way in which we perceive pressure in order to optimize self-esteem. I call this a different kind of SEO. So SEO is self-esteem optimization. SEM is self-esteem maintenance. And we want to make sure that the choices we're making are SEO and not SEM. Mm. I think in general, when it comes to self-esteem, people often thought, talk about sort of love yourself. But I've never met anybody who can truly go into a, go to a mirror and be like, you know, I love myself every day. Like you may wear a dress you like on a particular day and say, I look good today. You may feel good about losing a couple of pounds. But to actually be kissing yourself in the mirror, there's probably a problem if you're doing that. <laughs> so I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. So this raises a question, um, you know, that kind of is a tangent, but it's one that I'm interested to hear your perspective on. So, you know, a couple of days ago, I put a post on Facebook saying, what do you think we should have learned in school, but never did? And the three themes emerged, uh, which is funny because I think they're the three themes that you and I are more or less talking about. Um, you know, how do you uh, manage your psychology uh, and, you know, manage your emotions? How do you interact with the opposite sex? And how do you manage money? And I'm, I'm curious why you think it is that, you know, given the, the power of this information and the nature of it and the role that it plays in our ability to function as adults, why are we not taught about this in our schools? Yeah, I mean, I think people have a whole lot of hangups, right? Uh, I think people feel guilty about talking about money. They feel guilty about talking about relationships and sex. And I think people create this notion that, uh, emotions are a bad thing, that you really have to just be cognitive. So I'll tell you a couple things about this. Uh, Antonio Damasio wrote a beautiful book, um, which is called Descartes' Era. And in it, he explains that you cannot make an intelligent decision without emotions being involved. So not to know how to manage emotions is an absurd thing. I think not to know how to manage relationships, whether they are the same sex or the opposite sex, is really difficult because I think when people emerge in the world, all of a sudden, they don't really know how to talk to other people, what people think about, and it becomes, you know, like I think currently, for example, uh, you know, in the milieu of all of these accusations about harassment coming up, on the one hand, there is the absolute truth that where justice needs to be served, it needs to be served. On the other hand, you don't want to generalize from this that every man is like this and every woman is like this. And I think that people often look to their out groups to place their own burdens on them. I think men do this with women. I think women do this with men. I think, you know, blacks do this with whites, whites with blacks. I mean, everybody does this to everybody. The whole idea is for us to learn how to l listen to the other person and how to stay uncomfortable in difference so that we can begin to learn from each other. Like you don't have to, if the outcome of everything doesn't have to be agreement or disagreement. It can be learning. And I think that that's particularly important. So, and I think with regard to money, I think, you know, some people want to make a lot of money. Some people don't want to make a lot of money. 
it doesn't really matter. I don't. I think you should allow yourself to change your mind throughout your life, so that you can meet your needs. I, I've had lots of people in my practice, for example, who are like, oh, I'm not interested in money. All of a sudden they get married, they have kids, they're like, wait a minute, I need money for college, I need money to pay for a home, I need, and, and so allow yourself to change wherever you are, and remember that somewhere, someone in the world has allowed you to do this. So to come back to your original question about, um, you know, why are schools not allowing this, I think that there are hang-ups and stigmas around this, and I think that uh, my personal feeling is that schools should allow this because because if they do, they'll be able to adapt to practical things in life. There is one, uh, again, slightly tangential, but important thing I would want people to remember about school, which is that, that I think that we should never confuse education and intelligence. Every human being is endowed with a very powerful intelligence, you know, as uh, you know, Einstein has said, if, and I, I can't remember the exact professions he used, but essentially, if you ask a, a carpenter to do the job of a physician, you might think that he's dumb for the rest of his life. And similarly, if you ask a physician to do the job of a carpenter, you may think that the physician is dumb for the rest of his life. A lot of times our achievement is not about our basic intelligence, it's about what we've matched ourselves to. And until we find what that is, we should never give up, give up on our intelligence. I had someone in my practice the other day who talked about the fact that he was feeling really self-conscious about the fact that over the years, he has come to terms with his intelligence and he recognizes what it is, that it is powerful, but it seems to intimidate people. And he said people get afraid because he's always curious, always asking questions, always able to say when he doesn't know what's happening. And he said to me, you know, why are people so intimidated by that? And I said to him, and, it, and then he said, you know, it's not, and I'm not saying I'm like brilliant or anything. I mean, I, I wasn't a top student at school. And, you know, I looked at him and I said, well, you know, the, it's interesting what you're saying, because I was a top student at school, but I remember even consciously having this thought that it had nothing to do with intelligence, that it was simply about being able to do a math problem well, or know what to answer in literature, or play music well. This this is a, a particular context in which you get tested. I was less intimidated by his intelligence and much more intimidated by the thing that had found reasons to convince him that he was not smart for most of his life. And that's the question I would want to ask every person who's listening to this, regardless of what school has taught you. It's important to remember that school is only one framework for who you are and that there's a framework beyond that which is the real you. And if something in your life has convinced you that you don't know how to manage money, or you don't know how to manage relationships, or you don't know how to manage emotions, you probably do. And the idea is just to simply explore, experiment, remain open, and be open to change, which I think brings us back to the original theme of this, which is that the change is, is fundamental, but openness to change is even more fundamental. Wow. So I want to spend the rest of our, our conversation talking about two specific goals um, that one I have, I think other people may have them as well. One, the first one being, you know, we've talked a little, we kind of danced around the edges of, of finding a romantic partner relationship. And it was interesting to hear you talk about sort of, you know, time away, not focusing on this thing, because I know that I obsessively focused on it for a good amount of this year, and it's the problem still didn't, didn't get solved. Um, so one, I want to explore that. Like if we were to literally say, okay, let's take all the theoretical concepts that we've talked about and specifically apply it to how are we going to make sure that Srini is not single by the end of 2018. Yeah. And then the other one I want to talk about is making more money. Sure. So uh, there, there, are, there are two things here that I think I would say. One is uh, a lot of this I think is nuanced and a lot of this is not certain. So I've certainly worked, worked with a lot. I would say I've worked with more people who have ended up in relationships than those who haven't. But there are still people I've worked with who haven't been able to find what they've been looking for despite a lot of effort. So I think the situation is more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so the, I'll say some of the more obvious things first and then I'll, I'll go into the caveats. Yep. I, think, I think the first thing is uh, if you want to find someone, uh, you, you really want to reflect first on yourself. What is it about yourself that is not self-connected enough that you are not drawing others to you. So, for example, if you think about a singer at the height of her performance, the entire audience wants to rush forward as she reaches that high note. 
She's reaching that high note because she is connecting with the highest level of her own being. And because she is so self-connected, everybody wants to be connected to her. Similarly, the question for you is, what is your high note and are you connected with your high note? Because if you are connected with your high note, there won't be that much more that you will need to do. The, the second thing I would say is that it's important for you to use a certain amount of effort. You know, I have someone, for example, who I'm working with who lives in upstate New York. And, there, and she is a very, very sort of left person politically, very liberal. She's surrounded only by Republicans. She lives in a... Uh, she she is she is a vegan, so she's very sort of interested in uh, keeping keeping that going. But it's surrounded by people who mostly eat meat. Now, if you're going to put yourself in a situation where there's a low probability of finding someone, mm-hmm. it'll be exactly that. It's a low probability. It's still possible, but it's a low probability. So you want to ask yourself: Am I doing enough social things? Am I going out enough? So after you get the self thing sorted out, you want to ask yourself, am I, am I putting myself in that situation? Am I going out a lot? And am I actually sort of exposing myself to, to people I might like? The third thing I would say is, are you a victim of perfectionism? You know, I, I met someone the other day who said, uh, yeah, you know, I, I don't have a girlfriend. And I said, well, I said, because I, I never meet anyone who's perfect. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, have you met anyone who's met anyone who's perfect? Oh, well, you know, look at Tom Brady and, and Giselle. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, I mean, there's so many things that are, like, not the same about this. Like, firstly, you don't look like Tom Brady. <laughs> Secondly, even if you did look like Tom Brady, there are a lot of people who look like Tom Brady who have been for, for, the, for their entire lives with people who they haven't been able to stay with. So, you know, another classic example people point out are Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. Yeah. Right? It's sort of like, well, you know, if two people who are that good looking couldn't stand each other throughout <laughs> their lives, then, then maybe we can conclude that looks are not everything. Okay. That, that, that maybe there's something beyond looks that actually matter. Uh-huh. So, so avoid the trap of perfectionism. Sure. But, but rise to the occasion of, of what you actually truly desire. And I think that it's not so much, and this will sound philosophical, but I truly believe it's not. It's not so much about sort of what you, like, you know, a lot of people think attraction is like what I feel in the first second. And then they stick with it or they don't stick with it. Sometimes you can grow to love someone. You know, people who fall in love with their neighbors without having, with having known them for 20 years. It's like, well, wait a minute, I wasn't thinking of that person romantically. But now that I am, I'm actually feeling drawn to them. So allow the love to grow. Allow, uh, that I think is a separate point from the perfectionism. Allow the love to grow. And also allow your feelings to change the way you see someone. I remember someone saying to me once, was somebody was actually, I I worked with a computer engineer studying brains once. And it was kind of a fun time because I'd be clicking on the brains and she'd be clicking on the brains and we'd have conversations like that. And so she would say, uh, can I tell you something? And I'm, I said, sure. I said, who do you think I think is the sexiest man alive? And I would say, I don't know. Like, you know, I'd give her a few conventional names and just say, no, no, no. She'd say, I think it's David Letterman. <laughs> and I would say, what? And she'd say, no, I, I honestly think it is. Because honestly, the moment a guy makes me laugh, the way he makes me laugh, it just, it's a total turn off. And then you realize, wait a minute, there are things that can change how you feel about someone sexually that have nothing to do with their bodies. Uh-huh. And I think if we allow ourselves to connect with those things, it actually changes our perceptions of people's bodies. Uh, there's someone I see who, for her in the entire, like I think I've seen her for more than five years up until this point, where she kept on saying, and she's very good looking, very conventionally a particular way she would say things like ew I'll never be with a guy with like body hair that would be terrible ew I never the person she ended up being with and then married he had body hair from his neck downwards <laughs> and all across his back <laughs> and she's totally turned on by it and she said you know it's just it's just so weird like my whole life I was saying that and then when I had conversations with you I suddenly realized that there are other things about people that I truly like and Again, in this instance, she liked his sense of humor. She liked being with him. And she thought, you know, I, I'm turned on by this. I don't quite know how that happened. But there are people who will say, well, they'll make rules, right? If you make like a body hair rule, then you go out on a date and you notice like one strand of body hair. And you're like, mm, can't do this. This is impossible. You know, 
that can be taken up and taken care of in a number of different ways. So I think, I, and I think the last thing I would say is that I often find that a, an, in, an inner sense of desperation pushes people away because we have mirror neurons. So if you go on a date and you're thinking, oh, I hope this one works, you're anxious. So your brain's anxiety circuits are on. But the other person's brain has mirror neurons that mirror your brain. And so when you're anxious, they're not going to know that they're unconsciously picking up your anxiety, but they will leave that date saying, oh, man, I don't know what that was, but I just didn't feel comfortable that whole date. And it wasn't because they weren't comfortable. You didn't give them a chance to be comfortable. And maybe related to that, I will say that, that I think it counts for a lot if you can be real and you can even think out loud and even change your mind out loud. Because I think that the moment we start to want to present a certain exterior, we lose track of our authenticity. And, and people can tell when you're not being authentic, and it's really off-putting. So when you go out and when, you, when, you're meeting with, when you're meeting with people, remember to remain authentic. And then the last thing I'll say is there's someone who I have seen for a long time who's not attached. And in her case, I, I do believe that there are a lot of different things, complicated, unconscious things about her father. You know, she was very upset with her father because he had an affair. She, he, she, she general, even though logically she doesn't generalize to all men, when she sees men, there is this mild form of disgust. But she's also super smart, and there is a real part of her that's like, eh, you know what, I don't get up in the morning every morning saying, why don't I have this in my life? Like, I, I just don't. Like, my life's pretty full, and do what I'm doing. I don't want to become one of these people who's defensive about, I'm enough for myself. Because there are days when I don't feel like that. But overall, right now, given the number of things that can engage me, I'm not feeling like I, I'm just driven to be with someone so that I can tolerate their differences, have children, raise my debt, like whatever that is. Like I understand there's love and the way people talk about it, but I'm just not there. And I think to the extent that you can recognize that if you're not there and, and you don't feel like it's a sort of live or die thing, it opens up the space to attract people into your life. And, 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 I, and I think serendipity is a wonderful way to do this. You know, finally, I, I just think practically speaking, I, I know a lot of people who met people online and are actually married with kids with them. So uh, I think online dating can be effective if you screen effectively. And again, here, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think it's about screening the body or screening. It's, it's, and I don't, I'm not saying you shouldn't have a body preference or right. you shouldn't. You know, but I think like saying, okay, this person needs to be this height, this weight, they need to have this dimension of that, this dimension of that, you know, then maybe you're not actually looking for a life partner. There are places that can accommodate you more effectively. <laughs> Uh, funny, I, I, you know, half, I kind of feel like saying I need you to call my mom and, and explain all of this to her. <laughs> right, right. Um, <laughs> Wow, that was uh, that was mind blowing. Uh, really, really insightful. So let's do this. Let's finish up by talking about the next piece of this, which is probably of more interest to, to other people than, than you know the relationship thing was, which is personally to me. But um, m making more money, um, you know, what is it that prevents us from doing it? How much does your own story about money play a role? Um, you know, how much does the psychology of scarcity and abundance play a role? And how does your entire relationship with money affect all these other areas of your life that we've been talking about? Yeah, so I, I, I think that there are different approaches to this. One is more cognitive. And I think the cognitive one is the one that people find easier to grasp. So the first thing is, if you are telling your brain you want money, you may feel that that's the only message you're sending your, your brain. But a lot of times, you are also saying to your brain, but to make more money, I have to work harder. People are going to be greedy, they're going to want my money. What if I try and I fail? And by giving these mixed messages to your brain, consciously and unconsciously, your brain goes into a state of cognitive dissonance and you don't change in order to make more money. So the first thing I would say is from a cognitive perspective, do you have unconscious fears of making money? And if so, spell them out so you can understand what that is. The second thing is do not live in reality if you want a lot of money. Like the, the, and this, and I'm, I'm going to say this again, do not live in reality if you want a lot of money. And obviously this is an oversimplification of the fact that if you want a lot of, there's nothing that has been exceptional in the world that has come from reality. It's always come from imagination, whether it's an airplane, the internet, whether it's the newest iPhone, people imagine 
what they want, and then they construct a plan to get it. So the second thing I would say is engage your imagination. And there are particular ways you can create a strong mental image so your brain can help you navigate to your goal. You know, by doing it in the first person and the third person, by making sure you're de-stressed when you're imagining, by doing something like mindfulness meditation, by helping yourself really fill out the details of what the money would bring you. Create an image. Do you want to be on a yacht? Do you want to be in front of your computer? Do you want to be giving it out a chair? Like whatever the image is, ask yourself, how can I make this image so strong that my brain will respond to this image? And then the fourth thing is really think of in terms of possibility thinking. You know, is there a way in which I can actually make more money and, and have and have a greater possibility. And, you know, in my book, Tinker, Dabble, Doodle, Try, one of the things I point out is several people who we know is having a lot of money, people like Steve Jobs, people like Bill Gates, uh, have histories of taking time off. People like Mark Zuckerberg, where they, can, they hit walls, and rather than thinking harder, they pull away, and they allow their brains to go into an automatic creative state to come up with solutions. So, it's not just about doing more. Sometimes less is more when you're trying to get to where you want to get to. Now, that said, the absolute truth, and nobody really talks about this stuff publicly because it's so hard to talk about, but when I get people in my therapy practice saying, you know, I want more passive income, or I want, it, it gets into really funky territory. Like, you, you start to realize that pretty much everything in your body is controlled by your brain. Right? I mean, if you take your brain out, every other organ does not function properly. Like, it's very hard for your heart to function. But what's really interesting is that the, there are people who are psychosomatic theoreticians who say that, that, that we think that is, it's these narratives that matter, which the way I've been talking is mostly cognitive. So human beings have narratives which are like full puzzle pieces that are the stories of themselves but they also have puzzle pieces floating around. And these are random fragments and they don't have any part in the story because your brain won't accept it. Either it's a paradox, you know, like I, 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 I love my children but I hate my life. Like, no, nobody can quite integrate that well. Or we carry information as symbols in our brain. So there might be a feather, a flower, a word and the sound of someone screaming at you. Our, our brains carry information like this, and, inf and information like this can get in the way. So what they know is that, uh, I think a lot of clinicians will tell you that when these fragments in our brains are bound, uh, Wilfred Bion was a, was, a, was a person who called these beta elements, when these fragments in our brains are bound, they, our, our lives flow comfortably, and we don't have bodily symptoms, and we get to our goals more easily. But for them to be bound, there is a factor that needs to bind all of them, and we call this factor libido, which in psychological terms doesn't just mean sexual energy, it means aggressive energy, and it means motivational energy. And most people in the world have some form of this energy suppressed or repressed somewhere. And as a result, it creates chaos and havoc, and it prevents you from getting to your goal. So being in a therapy or even going on a hike and allowing yourself to let your mind wander out loud can help you encounter these puzzle pieces and help you practice this greater free flow so that the puzzle pieces are not tortured by not being bound together. And when you get deeply into a therapy, for example, I don't, and this is obviously going to sound absurd to anybody who's heard this for the first time, but I'll, I'll say it because I've, I've, I've been sort of fantasizing, rec wanting to say, it's not just do these five things and you'll get more money. Do these ten things and you'll get more money. It's There are other things as well, like these fragmented thoughts, where people who want passive income, what, what are they saying? They want something to come to them without trying. But they're also saying they want something to come to them even if they don't have any doorway for it. Which, at, when, when you talk to people about this, you realize some people have incredible anxieties about their sphincters. They have incredible anxiety about their, their bodily parts, and they are tightly wound up. And if they're tightly wound up, on the one hand, but on the other hand, they want things to come to them easily. They need to start thinking about how being tightly wound is not going to actually bring things to you. And by that, I don't just mean magically out of the ether. I mean, it's not going to release your mind to put you in a position 
where this money will come more easily to you. And the more you can relax into your real humanity, the more likely it is to come. So while I do think that setting goals is important, imagining that is important, using possibility thinking is important, being able to create the image strongly is important, uh, and, under, and, and addressing the underlying unconscious factors is important. I do think it's really important to recognize that we carry information in our brains that obstruct our goals that is often outside the narrative. Most people who listen to this podcast, I believe, would fall into that category. Because for most of us, it's not like we don't recognize what we need to do or we don't know where we need to go. It, it just feels like life is putting up some kind of wall and we can't go there. And so we try to adjust to it. And we're smart enough to know that we're trying a lot of things, but it's just not happening. And that's where we need to go into the unconscious process because the absolute truth is that the brain works in non-logical ways as well. And unless we engage this unconscious, either by going for a walk on a curvy path or by saying things out loud, that, you know, give yourself a little bit of non-logical time to wander through your mind and you will find that there are amazing pieces of, pu of puzzles that are lying about that are obstructing you in one way or another. Wow. Uh, this, there, there's one more thing I wanted to say, yeah, about, which I think do. is, is really, really important, which is, uh, you know, recently in June earlier this year, they, uh, so DNA is, is an archiving system. It can actually archive information. Like they've stored all the words of war and peace in DNA, like the actual words are stored in DNA. And in June of this year, for the first time in a living organism, in E. coli, they were able to take a, a GIF. I mean, the, the originator says it's GIF. People call it GIF, but they were able to take that file and of a galloping horse and insert it into DNA using a technology known as CRISPR. And then they were able to sequence the DNA and retrieve 90% of the video, which means that our DNA can contain videos. And the implication of that is that when we, that the transgenerational transmission of trauma, let's say someone in a former generation had an active video that was like, money is a bad thing. It's important for you to respect the family. We are not wealthy people. We are middle class people. I, you know, I hear people say this all the time. These kinds of things get transmitted to the next generation. And even though you may be a very elevated person and you may want something, these videos that are playing metaphorically in your brain or that you are inheriting through your DNA are impacting your life. And so going into your past and saying, is there something in my parents, is there something in my past where there was a prohibition against making money because if I did, there'd be a risk? Trying to come to terms with that can actually help you avoid this transgenerational transmission of trauma and focus on your resilience. Wow. Um well, this has been truly amazing. Uh, I mean, as, as I kind of expected, it would be you packed it with, uh, you know, a profound amount of insight. So I want to finish with one final question, which I've asked you at this point three times. Um, what do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? I think connecting with their individuality. I, I, I think that we share about 99.9% .9 of our genetic material anyway. So it's the 0.1% that's going to make things different. And we know that, Genes are, are not independent of the environment, and they're not independent of our personal influences. And so I think unmistakability has to do with authoring your own future by being in the present and responding to what your heart desires. You know, there's a, there's a quote, uh, there's a quote by D.H. Lawrence, um, there's a quote by D.H. Lawrence, which I think is, is pretty important, which, which basically says that, that man cannot live by his own will alone. With his soul, he must search for life, for it is life that we want. And I don't know if those are the, those are the exact words, but you know, effort and will is a little boring. There is a way in which we need to give ourselves passports to become explorers of our own worlds internally and externally. And I think unmistakable people are those people who have given themselves these passports to explore themselves on the inside and on the outside so that they can become authors of their own futures. Wow, absolutely amazing. Um, well, I can't thank you enough for uh, taking the time to join us and help us kick off the new year with your story and your insights. Thanks so much, Jim. It's really lovely to be on. Really appreciate it. 
Awesome. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person, because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.